if I start now? Hello? Yes. You see? Yeah, very I good. Look it up. Very good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, telling people about the Seinfeld uh, place near 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 where you live, where I where I took this picture with Ofer in 2019, and actually he liked to watch Seinfeld. Did you know that he was watching Seinfeld every night? <laughs> yeah, it's religious about it. <laughs> okay, so let me so let me start. Um, so we are here uh, to celebrate, of course, Ruben Ofer's uh, diverse career. And we're bringing together friends, colleagues, uh, former students and family members to remember his accomplishment and his uh, influence on, on our life. No? So on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, so Vera, Elizabeth, Carlos and myself, uh, I want to start by thank you, you all for participating and uh, your presence here is proof of uh, how significant Ruben was for us. Uh, so myself, I came to know Ofer, so we, I don't know, in Brazil, sometimes we treat very good people, very nice, very good friends by last names. And so here, uh, this, this was the case. So everybody knew Ruben as Ofer here. You know, we affectionately called him Ofer. <laughs> so I probably met him around 1996 only, uh, and we became good friends, but uh, we never worked together, but we became good friends. And the fact that I'm now working on cosmology is to some extent due to him and all this, uh, uh, workshops that he organizes, as we will hear about uh, during, this, uh, during the day. So what I want to do is to briefly describe his works in, a, in his long and productive career. Uh, so I'm not going to go into any details. And uh, of course, more details will be given in other contributions. So I, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, I think there are two words in Yiddish. So Yiddish, for, uh, for those who don't, doesn't know, so Yiddish is a German dialect spoken by Jews in Eastern Europe. And some of the words in Yiddish are already part of the English vocabulary. So I think there are two words in Yiddish that characterize over, in my opinion. So one is mensch, and mensch is a person who can be relied on, uh, on to act with honor and integrity. It also suggests someone who is kind and considerate. And I also have seen it used to mean an overachiever. And I really think uh, Ruben was all of this. And Kutzpa. So Kutzpa is the uh, quality of audacity. So to be really courageous and do things um, with ardor. And the reasons um, I, I think these words characterize Ruben will become clear uh, during the day. So there are three main periods in uh, Ruben's career, Ofer's career. So the uh, US period from 1932 to 1962 um, so he was a student at City College of New York, got a PhD in high. I'll describe this more detail a little bit later. Then the uh, years in Technion in Israel, and finally the years in Brazil from 1979, uh, 1979 to 2013, where he became, uh, he was all the way to professor emeritus. So this is uh, uh, Ruben's word line, and it's amazing that's a full circle. So of course he started uh, here, uh, from New York to Boston, then a postdoc at, at Lawrence Livermore, uh, Israel, Sao Paulo, and back to the US. So it's amazing that uh, you know, wandering around the world, he, uh, he did a full circle. That's amazing. So let me describe the uh, US years very quickly uh, from 1932 through 1962. So Ruben was uh, born Raymond Fox in 1932 in the Bronx. Um, to immigrants, Jewish, uh, Russian, actually Ukrainian parents. And his father was a jewelry designer. Yiddish was spoken at home. And he did not speak English until he was five years old. And he attended high school in the Bronx, this Adlai Stevenson High School, which actually closed in 2009. So be careful with schools. And he was a scientist. He joined, uh, joined uh, the Zionist youth movement. For short, what was more uh, Hashomer, uh, Hashomer Hatzair, and later the Habonin drawer. And, and then uh, after high school, he went to the City College of New York, and he was one of the three best students in the City College of New York. So I, I should say that all of this, I got from an, uh, some conversations, which actually I was with Merav, I don't know if Merav remembers, uh, I recorded this in a restaurant, <laughs> so in an old iPhone. So I had this interview with him and was telling the stories to me because I usually I like to hear stories, but I forget them. So this time it took a, 
uh, iPhone to record the stories. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> you remember that, right? <laughs> so, uh, so after, uh, because he was one of the best students at City College New York, he was accepted at Harvard. And he did his PhD uh, with a uh, Nobel Prize winner, Norman Renzi. So he stayed there from 1953 to 1958. So Norman Renzi, of course, is mostly known for his uh, molecular work, but he also worked in a cyclotron, 160 MeV cyclotron. And that was where Reuven was working. So, uh, so his work was to test the uh, model, uh, the liquid drop model for nuclei. And this, nu and this model predicted that if you bombarded uh, the nuclei uh, with high energy uh, protons, and the, it would emit isotropically. So, uh, so Reuven constructed a detector that went around the target uh, using photographic emotions to detect the particles. And he told me the story that, you know, had to, had to have this round thing to go around the detector. And, and uh, Norman Renzi uh, found a friend of his at the uh, Navy shipyard in Boston, and they got a gun turret. So this thing that goes around to serve, to rotate around the detector. So this is what was used to, uh, to, to look at the angular distribution of the, uh, of the particles emitted by the uh, nuclear when bombarded by, uh, by these protons from the uh, cyclotron. So his PhD was in nuclear physics, and this is the uh, title of the PhD. So this is, uh, his, uh, this is actually from the Harvard page. Uh, so it's angular and energy distributions of low energy protons from targets bombarded by high energy protons. So this was his PhD. So after his PhD, he went uh, to work at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. So this is uh, Edward Teller's laboratory. Uh, so where people were developing the, uh, um, the hydrogen bomb developed the hydrogen in the bomb by then. And uh, he was also a uh, Hazan. Hazan is a singer in a synagogue, <laughs> this time in Berkeley, uh, was a Hillel place, and also in San Francisco. This is some uh, other aspect of, of Reuven. He was a very good singer, as probably people will uh, talk about uh, during, the, uh, during the day. And at, the Lar at Lawrence Livermore, uh, he was part of the uh, quote unquote, advanced ideas group for rocket interplanetary trips. That's amazing. No people think about rocket interplanetary trips there at uh, that time. And the idea that they, they wanted to, it's important to have a source of energy. And of course the source of energy people are thinking about was nuclear reactors. And the problem that uh, uh, Ofer attacked was how to uh, transform the energy. Right here, baby. The, uh, the heat from nuclear reactor to electricity. And he came up with this idea of plasma. Sorry, uh, so with plasma and uh, and this so-called plasma diode. And in fact, uh, he has a patent of plasma diode. So I think that's that's how his interest in plasma physics started. And he also worked the uh, cyclotron in uh, Livermore. So this is just uh, some of the works that he did uh, uh, while at uh, Livermore. So, uh, so this is the plasma diode uh, work. And um, so the, he has several works on, on plasma diodes. And this is actually the patent uh, for the plasma diode. So, so he filed the patent in 1963 and uh, it was approved in 1966. It was already in Israel when it was approved. So he has a patent on this plasma diode heat converter. The idea again was to convert, convert heat from nuclear, uh, nuclear reactor to electricity. But he also worked with the uh, Livermore 90-inch uh, cyclotron, so he's still doing nuclear physics. Then uh, they decided to go to Israel and uh, talk about briefly about the Israel years because we hear more about that. He got an NSF fellowship to go to the Weizmann Institute, 1961-1962. So he was again working in nuclear physics, and this is just to say that he was a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow. 1961-1962. And afterwards, he was invited by Nathan Rosen of EPR fame to join the physics department at the Technion in 1962. So Rosen was working in the theory of gravitation, and I think that influenced Ofer a lot to, uh, in his research. So there were many interesting works with his students, uh, Joseph Shamir, who is now a professor emeritus at the Technion, on testing special relativity. In fact, uh, he told me that they constructed a high precision maximum Morley interferometer when he was at the Technion. 
He was also given a two hundred thousand dollar grant uh, when he arrived at Technion. He used that or half of that actually, to buy a copper Walton accelerator. And with that, uh, he did some nuclear physics studies. And he also studied the uh, Compton scattering to understand the distribution of the electron's energy uh, with uh, uh, Joshua Felsteiner. I think we'll hear more later about that. Here are some of the works he did with uh, Shamir uh, on the uh, studies of redshift, uh, propagation of light from matter, uh, testing the idea of uh, cosmological redshifts, and testing uh, special relativity using this very precise Michelson-Morley interferometer and test of the equivalent principle, again, using this Michelson-Morley interferometer. He also worked on uh, faster than light velocities, causality violations, and taxion. And those, uh, has, he wrote papers with Steve Lipson. He's, Steve is going to talk about these papers uh, uh, just after my talk. Uh, so I'm not uh, delve on this further. And, and here, uh, I, I this is an, I think this is an example of really chutzpah, you know? <laughs> he proposed particles, uh, which he called the books. So the books is a word in Hebrew for uh, freely, uh, can be he freely translated, meaning roving spirit. I think it's demons, really. <laughs> and these are particles which have, so tachyons are particles that have imaginary mass. D-books are particles that have imaginary mass, imaginary energy, and imaginary momentum. Everything is imaginary in D-books. And uh, he published this in Nature, okay? So this is published, <laughs> published in Nature. Uh, so this is, a, this, is, this is kind of foods that I was talking about. So he also worked in Compton scattering with gamma rays. So they had a, he told me he bought a source of gamma rays. I think it was cobalt 12, uh, some cobalt source. So many papers with Joshua, uh, he's going to talk about on Compton profiles, etc. And this one was the last paper of Raymond Fox. This, this one here in 1973 was the last paper of Raymond Fox. He changed his name to Uvenhofer after that. So there is an interlude of the Israel years. He took a sabbatical year at NASA Ames and started a new research area in quasars. So it was going towards astrophysics. And that's where he told me that uh, that's, he learned to play the guitar during this, uh, this postdoc. He told me that it was, he saw an ad of uh, guitar classes for $5 and he decided to take guitar class. <laughs> and he learned three chords and did three chords can do a lot in guitars. And this is what he told me. So, so this is a paper about uh, uh, a tier of galactic nuclei and, and quasars. And of course he was trying to see if D books could be used to explain uh, uh, what was observed in quasars. So I call it the books in the sky. <laughs> and also <laughs> he was thinking about the uh, uh, measurement, uh, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And he also thought that uh, this guy, the books can uh, help in the collapse of wave function. If you look at the abstract uh, here, you see that uh, he, he, can, he, he tries to show that a D book theory can, can uh, can help to explain the collapse of the wave function. So now he also turned into more mainstream things. Uh, so uh, this is a mainstream paper on origin of quasar absorption lines when he was, uh, and this is can see that uh, he changed his name, Ruben Ofer, and, and has an asterisk here that the, uh, the author's name has recently been changed from Raymond Fox to Ruben Ofer, and he was on leave of absence from Technia. And this paper I found amazing also. So this is a, a first of a series of papers that uh, Ruben uh, wrote about coherent scattering of neutrinos. So as maybe you know, uh, the Big Bang theory predicts a, a cosmic background of neutrinos, which are very low energy and very difficult to detect. And, and Ruben uh, studied the possibility of detecting using coherent scattering. And he has a series of papers on that. And I just put this paper up because uh, only recently, the coherent elastic uh, scattering of neutrinos were observed, but from high energy uh, neutrinos from nuclear reactors. So cosmic neutrinos were never observed uh, yet, but uh, there are the experiments to try to observe them. So he also wrote several papers with his PhD student, uh, Dov Fallick, on the consequences of this uh, uh, alternative theory of gravity by Rosen called the bimetric theory. And uh, Dov was the last of the seven PhD students he supervised at the Technion. 
And in fact, uh, they show that the, the biometric theory does not pass uh, observational tests. So they basically ruled out uh, uh, this biometric theory of uh, Rosen. So now I, uh, I talk about the Brazilian years from 1979 to 2014. So I like to say life starts at 50. So at 50 years old, he <laughs> moved to Brazil. It was a complete reinvention. So why would anyone dare to do a full, he was a full professor at to come to Brazil and start anew from zero, right? So this, this is chutzpah, no, this is, he had this, um, he would, has the courage of starting a new, in a new country. So I will be very sketchy now, and I, I think there will be many more details in the following talks. But uh, he started with sabbatical leave in Sao Paulo. He was invited by uh, Pierre Kaufman, who actually he met uh, in Israel, I think. Uh, so he spent 1979, 1980 uh, working in the group of Pierre Kaufman at this uh, CRAM Observatory, Na uh, National Observatory on CNPq in, in this neighborhood called Higienopolis, where he actually came to live most of his life uh, here in Brazil, in Rua Pará. And this, I think, is the first paper I, I, I found uh, with his uh, sabbatical. Uh, so he was a sabbatical from Technion working at this uh, CRAM. So it's a, it's a center for radio astronomy and astrophysics. So uh, we, we'll hear more about this later from Zulema and Jacques, but uh, they, they have a radio observatory here. And he was working on that. Uh, he decided to work on that. Um, so by 1981, uh, Oprah's affiliation is only the National Observatory. So I think he officially leaves Technion in 1981. And uh, this, is the, this is a paper, again, uh, detection of solar cosmic interference by coherent scattering. And, and the only affiliation here is Observatory Nacional. And also there's a, a paper with Zulema on, uh, on detection of a giant outburst uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, water maser feature uh, in Orion. So by 1981, he's officially uh, only uh, in Brazil, only uh, an Observatório Nacional in Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo office of the Observatório Nacional. Now, you know, <laughs> these things that happen in Brazil, you know, <laughs> the, this office of the National Observatory is closed. It's just closed, just uh, out of the blue. And the whole group of Kaufman moved to INPE, which is another institute, the like National Institute of uh, space research, but Ofer did not move to, to INPE. And, and he's, uh, he moved to the, observa the National Observatory headquarters in Rio. And he was commuting from Sao Paulo to Rio for six months. So this was a very difficult period. And uh, uh, eventually in 1982, fortunately, Ofer transfers to the EAG. This is to the to become a professor emeritus. So this is the first paper I found with the affiliation of Ofer with the uh, uh, IAG, Instituto Astronomico Geofísico. So uh, Ofer had a huge impact in Brazil. He formed 13 PhD students, organized two very successful conferences that we hear about. Uh, he had, he had to, in Brazil, we have compos compulsory retirement. So he retired from IAG in 2002 as a full professor. And he worked as a voluntary professor, uh, sorry, as voluntary senior professor until 2014 and became professor emeritus in 2015. He went back to the US in 2014 where his twin daughters were here, very successful physics professors. And he was living in New York City, just a couple of kilometers from the place where he was born. That's, that's amazing. So the main areas of research uh, that he was dedicated, uh, you can see from this plot that I took from ADS, this, uh, so uh, he was very active in uh, plasma physics, so often waves, etc., cetera, wind stability, uh, extragalactic uh, uh, sources, jets, uh, filaments. Um, he, he has lots of works on um, primordial magnetic fields, magnetic fields, primordial magnetic fields. He was very uh, interested in magnetic fields. And also by metric theory, gravitation, and, uh, and also in cosmology, energy fluctuations, vacuum, energy, etc. So he had, uh, uh, he was really broad. He could do everything, you know, it's amazing. He could, uh, he worked in several different areas in physics and astrophysics and cosmology. 
So as, as Ruben Ofer had uh, 335 papers, that's what I found in this uh, ABS. So it uh, has more papers as, of course, as Raymond Fox with uh, uh, 1400 uh, citations. So this is the distribution of papers. It's amazing. Uh, it was extremely productive. And I, I, I decided to look at the 10 most cited papers uh, at, with this database of ABS. And that's uh, interesting. Uh, the most cited paper is this paper of Jeff Kaufman, Evidence for quasi quantization of Solar Flare uh, in Millimeter Wave Radiation. So maybe Zulema can explain why this paper is so important. Uh, <laughs> and also the second most uh, cited paper, again, according to ADS, is, uh, is this paper with uh, Zulema. So uh, that would be interesting. And you can see paper uh, with Vanna Pellison, uh, Vera, uh, Josh, uh, Joshua Filsteiner, etc. Right. So it has several collaborators. Most of them were <laughs> students, even. Um, and this is only the uh, ten most uh, cited papers. Also, we can see here the collaborators. So this is uh, this is uh, the, the size of the name reflects the number of papers that they have together. So he has a whole. Uh, uh, whole network of collaborators. And again, most of the collaborators were his students. So this, is, this is very, very impressive. Um, so you can see uh, Vera here, Jose Carlos here, Merav, et cetera, Elizabeth. Actually, Elizabeth appears two times because I think there's a, Elizabeth, I have to see this. There's a, a capital D and small d here. I don't know, this is this database again from ATS. So, uh, so he organized this series of workshops we will hear about, and I think this was the last time he came to Brazil. So this was 2016, this uh, 13th workshop on new physics in space at uh, ICTP Safer in Sao Paulo. And you can see uh, Ofer, Betty, myself, and several other people here in the audience uh, for this uh, uh, workshop. Um, and he kept active, he kept active until the end. So he was teaching at the Institute of Retired Professionals in New York City. This is a picture I got from the site. Uh, so this is a, uh, a talk, uh, a tribute to Stephen Hawking. And uh, I like this picture because, you know, here you can see that Ruben was really a cosmologist, you know? <laughs> so he was, he was Ruben Ofer, a cosmologist. So, uh, so this is, this is really nice. So he, he taught cosmology for retired professionals in, in New York City. Um, so here we are, and uh, we're going to celebrate in this uh, memorial the incredible life of, it's really incredible, Ruben Ofer. And you probably learned some Yiddish by now, a true mensch with lots of chutzpah. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, You don't have to applaud. So, um, okay, so we are, I, I finished a little bit early, but I don't see why not. Uh, we can continue with Steve Lipson and, and Josh. Maybe, I can, maybe if, if you finished a couple of minutes early, is that okay if we, uh, if, if we make some comments or questions? Of course. So that's the same time. Um, mm -hmm. a, you know that the high school that you mentioned that uh, uh, Ruven went to, the actual building closed, but the high school itself remained. Uh, it just moved to a different location and it is considered number one in uh, uh, definitely in New York State. Uh, and it's one of the Hello top everybody. five I am Garima in the Chabon, world. And today I will be talking about the Hadrian velocity definitely in the US. and what we can And guess who is going to uh, this high school? His grandson. That's amazing. <laughs> so when he when he went uh, when Eitan uh, uh, is, is is on the screen also yeah he's waving uh, got admitted uh, to to the school. Ruven went with him and showed him uh, what he remembered. Uh, it was very different, but still, it was heartwarming. That's, that's, that's very nice. I, I looked it up and uh, I saw that it closed off. I didn't know it went to a different building. It just said closed off. 
yeah. so that's nice. And there's something I asked uh, Ruben explicitly because there, there was a very famous school in the Bronx called the Bronx School of uh, High School of Science. I yes, think. but Rogerio, that's number two. But in, <laughs> <laughs> so that still exists? Yes, it does. As you know, many Nobel Prize winners went to that school. Steven Weinberg, Shelley Glashow. Yeah. So, so I asked him why he didn't go to that school. And they said, oh, because my older brother went to the Adlai Stevenson, and uh, that's where I went. <laughs> but, uh, you know. No, but they are, they are exactly. They're the same types of schools, Bronx Science, Stevenson. There are a few others that are the, the same style for more math and science. And yeah, it's interesting. I said, it's a full circle again, no? There's a full Hello, circle. Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline. If you want to read a full circle, I'll, I'll show it later. Student at the University of Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline, a PhD student. Number five, uh, 40, 452 Riverside Drive. Okay, 452 Riverside. On 4, 5, on 450, uh, it was. Ah, on 456, so two buildings away, he's. A uh, half brother lived 20 years. Uh, uh, 20. So he was 20 years old, and this was in 19. Hi everyone. My name is. Three. His brother lived two buildings away. That's it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you, Michal. Thank you, Michal. So, um, Stephen and Joshua, how do you want to do this? I, I, I think you can share your screens. Uh, Steve is mute. Is, you're muted. Steve, we cannot, we cannot hear. Steve? Yes. And Joshua? Yeah, well, we're not going to talk at the same time. So, let's uh, each of us talk. Who wants to start? I don't know. I can start if you like. Okay. I'm yes, sorry. Sorry. Steve, you'll start. Okay, I'll start and you take over when in about quarter of an hour's time, okay? So, um, well, thank you for the invitation. I wish to uh, uh, um, give our um, condolences to the family that Ruben was with, indeed a very uh, bright person. We had a lot of interaction while, while we were together. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things which we did. Uh, together in the Technion. Now, um, Ruben was at the Technion from 1962 to 1978. And then he, had, then he went on sabbatical and he didn't come back again and eventually left the Technion staff. But anyhow, during those years, we had quite a lot of interaction, um, except that I only came in 1966. So the first four years, we didn't have any interaction. And then after that, we did. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the few things which we, which we did together. Um, do I have the possibility of sharing the screen just to put a... Yes, you're yes, okay. Okay, so um, let's see if I can find it. I did my best to get things ready. Here we are. That's the one I want. Yes, okay. So... This, uh, th uh, this was actually our first, I mean, that, there were only about three or four written contributions together, but we had some ideas which we developed are, were also, are also relevant. Um, this is, was our first, first work together in 1969, published in 1969 in Nature, um, about whether, uh, together with the late Charles, Charles Cooper, three of us together worked on this, and we had... Um, we, we were discussing the idea of tachyons, that is, particles which travel fast, if, uh, faster than the velocity of light, which, of course, are not allowed by, like to... uh, by relativity. But anyhow, why not? And since the idea of the transfer of information or transfer, uh, uh, it goes like the idea which we generally give to students is that the, the, the transfer of information goes like the group velocity. And so, and you prove it to them and show them the group velocity is the omega decay and so on and so forth. And then it comes the question, well, what about the case where the omega decay is greater than the velocity of light? Does this mean you can 
transfer information faster than the velocity of light. Um, well, it, uh, uh, the, the point is, I, I don't want to go into all the theory, it's a very nice idea and you can see it can all be expressed in less than one page. But anyhow, the, the idea is that um, the very high group velocities come with, are, are connected to very high absorption in the material. And what you find is that if you have a very high group velocity, you have very, very high, uh, very high absorption. And it turns out in the end that the, uh, in order to distinguish the velocity from the velocity of light, you need to take a certain amount of time, which means a certain distance. And that distance is always considerably greater than the absorption distance in the material. So eventually, well, everything works out okay. But anyhow, there is a nice proof of this in terms of uh, contour integrals, which, um, which was developed by Riwin um, in about 1920 or 1930, something like that, which, um, which shows that in fact, what you have to define is not a group velocity. The transfer of information goes like a signal velocity, which is a, which is a wave group, which has a, sharp, a very sharp beginning to it. And then you can measure its velocity exactly. You don't need to integrate over the whole of the wave group. And in that case, the very high frequencies are very strongly, um, is very strongly influence, influence the proper propagation. And therefore, as a result, the, um, as, 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 as a result, the velocity, uh, the, the maximum velocity for the signal velocity is actually the, uh, the limit of the velocity of your light or whatever at um, as infinite velocity, uh, infinite frequency. And that, since nothing can ever respond at infinite frequency, that comes out to be the velocity of light. So this was shown by Brewan mathematically, and we, ad we adapted his, his proof to show this. this was the case for any type of, um, any type of, um, of, of signal. And uh, this was published in, as you can see, in 1969 in Nature. And uh, it was, in fact, it's interesting, this paper, although it didn't actually appear in the largest number of citations, which you showed a short while ago, but in fact, the, um, this, this paper is, is still being, be, be, uh, I, I still get notices that it's being, being cited, which is interesting. I was, I'm surprised at that, but, um, but this, you can see it's, it's essentially half a page long and it has a few very relevant, uh, very relevant um, references. Anyhow, the, uh, we, later we developed this in, into a, the mathematics in a greater degree, probably the, about the only mathematical paper I've ever had a hand in, uh, in, a, in a paper which was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in London, and uh, that's um, and that that subject is is one of the two things I worked with him on. The other one was a um, was a an experiment to now let's see if I can get this on quickly. Um, okay, yes, this is now you can see this one is Joseph Shamir and. Reuven Fox, still uh, Raymond Fox, I'm sorry, still Raymond Fox, before he changed his name. Um, this was Shamir's doctorate, and we had a close collaboration over this. He, they actually did the experiment, but I, I was con concerned in one, one important part of it. Yeah, the new test of special relativity was to repeat the Michelson-Morley experiment, and they built the whole system on a um, on an optical table which weighed six, uh, sorry, three and a half tons. It was floating on mercury, and they were using what was then a very new instrument called a laser, which they built the uh, they built the interferometer to, to work with the laser, and they looked at the interference fringes and uh, observed what happened when the table was slowly rotated by ninety degrees, so that it, you could. Um, move the direction of movement of the ether from one to the other. Ether, of course, being the, the um, hypothetical mat material filling all space. Well, um, Michelson and Morley did this experiment with a rather more complicated apparatus in order to get longer dis 
craft differences, and but using a conventional light source. And Michelson and Morley got a um, managed to live it to show that the velocity of light didn't depend on the direction of travel um, by more than one part in, in 100. <laughs> that is one. And he got it, uh, let's say that's not, that's not true. It was a measure, made a measurement to one hundredth of a, of a um, interference fringe. You have to multiply that by the length, path length and so on to get the difference in velocity. So uh, they, they made them that measurement to with a, an accuracy of one hundredth of an interference fringe. And this meant that there was still some uncertainty about you know, whether, whether uh, the result was absolutely true, because maybe you know, to, to that extent, they did choose a time when the, the ether was traveling in the, uh, was, we, ha we happened to be stationary with respect to the ether. And, they, and um, Shamir and Ruven did the experiment with a much higher degree of accuracy, that was their idea. And uh, th that was where my, my uh, contribution came in. I developed together with, with, with them a very accurate methods of measuring interference fringe movements, which was to use a split, uh, to, to use two photoresistors. You took two photoresistors, one of them on, um, the, let's say each one of them half on half a fringe, but the right one on the right hand side and the other on the left hand side. And then if the fringe moves, the intensity on one goes up and the other goes down. And these photoresistors were balanced in a Wheatstone bridge and you looked at the out of balance current and we got to an accuracy of, of uh, one ten thousandth of a interference fringe. This was published by us jointly in, in um, applied optics at the time. And in fact, it's a method which is now routinely used in all the um, old things like the um, uh, the like the um, atomic force microscopes and so on for measuring very very small movements of the tip. So uh, I believe that this was the first application of a of a different a first differential measurement of interference fringes. But at that time we didn't know that the subject was going to become so important afterwards. Anyhow, that 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 period we worked on trying to do this um, experiment to a high degree of accuracy and. Eventually, uh, as the, this experimental test here, which if I can move down and show you the results, which um, which are here, um, experimental system. They here, here we are. Um, this delta, that's the movement, is less than one three thousandth of a fringe. We could measure one ten thousandth of a fringe, but when they did the the uh, the, um, the did the an analysis in the proper manner, we got to one three thousandth of a fringe, and that was the smallest distance. And it was smaller distance than that when we when the, the system was rotated by ninety degrees. So that's um, that was a great contribution, the a collaboration which we had. And after that, uh, Shamir went on to be a professor at Technion in electrical engineering. And I continued in physics. And um, a few years after that, in, uh, as, as you know, uh, Ruben left the left, left Technion and sabbatical, and in fact did not return as a faculty member after that, although visited occasionally. Now, um, just one or two uh, other things apart apart from the uh, the apart from the, the measurements of um, apart from the measurements which we did together. Um, I came uh, after Ruben and family had been in Brazil for some years. Um, I came, uh, had the opportunity of visiting Sao Paulo, visiting Brazil, and to go to a conference. And I thought it would be nice to come and visit um, Ruben and Darella. And um, I came, I actually did give a, give a seminar in your department. I do not remember what the topic was. There's something to do with astronomy. I really don't remember. And uh, but anyhow, I came to Sao Paulo and visited. visited. I came with, with uh, David Tannhauser, another method, member of our department. Two of us visited, visited Brazil for this, for this uh, 
for this uh, conference, for a conference where we presented our work. And uh, as I said, I came to, to visit the, the office in their, uh, in their department and in the department where you are, I presume now. So that was one at a time. And then since then, I've seen, met Ruven several times in Bar Mitzvah of Eitan, uh, when, uh, when Michal and, and Ruven and Eitan came to Israel for a short while, and Eitan in fact stayed with us. And I met him a few times, but the last time was maybe two, two or three years ago. And for after that, for, since then, I didn't meet him. So. I wish you all the best. Is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, no, that's a pa pa essentially a summary of what I did together. Tell the story about the, the famous story about the cookies. Cookies? What was the story about the cookies? I don't remember. I oh, the, oh, 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 yes, 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 you're right, yes. Anecdotes, anecdotes. The last cookie. The last cookie story, that's right, yes, yes, the last cookie story. Um, when we, uh, the, in the winter in Israel, uh, at least in those days, there were very frequent power failures. And we used to go every afternoon down to the tea room, still do, uh, down to the tea room in the department for, to have a, have a drink, coffee, tea, or something like that, and there were some cookies as well. And we were sitting there with the plate of cookies in the middle and everyone was taking them and until there was one left, that everybody, uh, all the people sitting around the table were thinking, should I take that cookie? It's not nice to take the last one. And then suddenly there was, was this power failure. The whole place went absolutely blank. So I put out my hand. I thought, now is the time to take the cookie. And, but unfortunately, there were 10 more hands underneath mine. So that's, uh, that just shows that all physicists think the same way, maybe. Anyhow, uh, any more stories you remember, Michal? <laughs> Well, I, I actually do remember that Ruven, when he came back to, to Israel after, after he left the Technion, uh, maybe 10 years after, he was very emotional. We, and I walked... No, no, Ruven. Yeah. yeah, so we, I walked in Hi. with him I'm into the Jetty. department, and the first person he saw was actually you, Steve. Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad, uh, <laughs> glad you remembered me. Anyhow, <laughs> you know, at our age, things. Uh, <laughs> things <laughs> uh, so, um, are, are you sure? Are you ready to continue? With no. Your side of the story? Not yet. You had. We can see your picture anyhow. Yeah, I think Joshua. Now. Anyhow, so as I said, the cookie story, of course, finished. I forgot to say that the hand underneath my hand was Rufin's. That was the important thing about it, as far as this is concerned. And ten hands were there, and he was number nine, and I was number ten. And, and so I, I should say neither that, of us got the cookie. I should say that the degree of embarrassment was sufficiently high that both of them remember that story <laughs> many years later. <laughs> That's correct, yes. Yeah, and I've heard it from Aitam too. Because like he told me the story too. So everybody knows the story. <laughs> okay, so, well, um, it'd be interesting to hear the things about the rest of Ruben's professional life. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh. Thank you, Steve. So, so Joshua, can you. Uh, just, uh, just a minute. It's... Oh. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. And do you see me? I don't see myself. Uh, we can see you and hear you. See you and oh, now you. I see you also. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a uh, real, uh, I'm really excited <laughs> to, to be in this uh, forum now uh, because I worked with a woman for a long time and uh, uh, on top of what uh, Steve said about all the different uh, chutzpah things that he did 
tried so many things in physics. He tried with me also a number of things. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, uh, I will try first to see if I can uh, put a screen. Okay, yes. Wait, do you see me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. You see it well. Okay, here, here it is, okay. Um, okay, uh, it's, uh, around 1970, uh, Hi, I'm Alan. came uh, to me with the idea of or, doing yeah. something with Compton scattering. He was not sure exactly what will happen after that, the results will be. But he thought about this idea of doing Compton scattering on materials uh, and, showed, and uh, apparently we found that uh, it was uh, started already before by other people, but he started, he thought about it for himself, he was original in this because he didn't know about the other people. Uh, but what was original is that the other people did Compton scattering of X-rays on materials with X-rays that you get from uh, the old machines. That means this 17 kV uh, X-rays. And uh, there with, the machines were not with enough intensity and also the energy was not good enough and the directionality of the experiment was not good enough. So let me just try to see what, uh, to show what, uh, first of all, to just to mention to people that would like to see this again, Compton scattering is when photons scatter from electrons and uh, the scatter photon then has a lower energy uh, it depends, uh, depending on the scattering angle, any scattering angle that you choose, you get different energy lower than the original photon energy. Now, to describe this, uh, you use the klein ishina scattering cross-section, but this uh, cross-section assumes, or klein ishina assumes, that the electrons are at rest. And then uh, they got this scattering cross-section. If you, however, in matter, the electrons are bound to the atoms. Some of them are free, of course, like uh, in metals there are free electrons and other things. Uh, and then the scattering then depends both on the scattering angle as before, but also on the, on the electron velocity or better to say electron momentum. Uh, therefore, in even in a particular, even if you even choose a, a monochromatic X-ray or gamma ray, uh, the result, when you, when, uh, if you measure at a particular angle, you still see a spectrum. And this spectrum is called the, the Compton profile. Uh, now, uh, if you start from theory, you have wave functions. Now, if you take a wave function and you put, make a Fourier transform, uh, you get momentum wave function. And from that, by integration, you can get the Compton profile. That means uh, uh, that when you measure Compton profiles, you can really test even wave functions. And you can uh, really, if you work with metals, you can even test band structure and things like this. That means really go deep into solid state theory and experiment, of course. Now, uh, our idea was to, instead of these X-rays of 17 kV, which were not intense enough, uh, we suggested to use uh, gamma rays of uh, americium uh, 40, uh, 41 
uh, that's about 60 keV, 60 keV, and with and uh, let's go. Okay, the first paper that we published uh, in 1970, uh, well, we submitted in 1970, we got in 71 in the solid state communication. So, uh, you see already we published that, uh, this uh, polycrystalline iron, and uh, we used, as you say, 59.54 uh, uh, keV, americium-241 gamma rays, and uh, we received very nice results and were in marked contrast with the recent uh, X-rays of this 17 keV. And we try to explain all things about this. And uh, I won't go into this too much. Uh, but the idea of, uh, all the idea of starting this quantum profile came from Ruben. And uh, okay, the next paper that I can show is uh, in 72, I've submitted it in 71, yes? Comes on profile of lithium H, uh, something given, uh, we already learned the field even a bit more deeply. And uh, we could say a lot of things about it because in addition, uh, in, in, in fact, we started, uh, we, uh, uh, we went deeply into solid state theory. And if you can read it, uh, we can, uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, calculations to show that we get agreement with experiment. That means we did also the experiment. One thing I want to say about uh, uh, Ruben, that uh, if you think he is a theorist, you are, it's not correct. He's also a very good experimentalist. And when we started, uh, we, did, uh, we did it together and uh, uh, all this experiment. And later we did other experiments uh, and it was just as good as being a theorist. This is a, uh, by the way, uh, okay. After that, we uh, went to a conference in Florence in Italy. That was the first European conference on the physics of condensed matter, uh, September 71. And I am in the middle, Ruben, of course, you recognize on the side, very young guy. Uh, and uh, over there, we uh, reported on our uh, work about this gamma ray Compton scattering. Uh, now, what happened after uh, we discovered people also um, pointed it to us that we might have problems with multiple scattering uh, because uh, the photon, when it goes into the material, uh, if the material is heavy, of course, uh, the photon will do multiple, multiple scattering in the material, which makes the results very, uh, not very, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 not very good. Uh, and therefore we had to do something of multiple scattering calculations in order to remove the effect of multiple scattering. And uh, it just happened in that in 1973, uh, I went to uh, on sabbatical to England to Warwick, University of Warwick, and there together with some collaborators, uh, we did calculations on this uh, multi, uh, of the effect of multiple scattering on experimental pro control profiles. And we used Monte Carlo calculations to do it. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we didn't use the klein schina formula for that works for only for electrons in uh, at rest, but we used a formula, an extended formula, which was, uh, which appears in the book of Landau and Lifshitz, and one of the books of Landau and Lifshitz, which includes also 
electrons which are not at rest. Okay, finally, after this sabbatical, we came with good result, uh, and I came back to the Tachyon, and uh, this is the first one, the first result that we get when we are much more sure about result, the results, because we corrected for multiple scattering the whole thing. And this is the gamma ray Compton profile of polycosinal lithium. And uh, okay, uh, then we did many other things. I will tell you a bit later, not much later. Uh, you see that even after Ruben left, that would still work that we continued. And here you see this was uh, submitted 1980 and published 1981. And uh, uh, this was a magnesium hydride and it was a, a, a large collaboration also with our friend in Sweden because uh, we needed some experts in solid state theory to collaborate with us in order to do all what uh, we intended to do. Now, what happened next, uh, or actually before, in 1976, if you see, I submitted 1975. Uh, after I came back with the solution of uh, this multiple scattering problem, again, Ruben came with a grand new idea. Why don't we use it in astrophysics? And the first thing we, uh, okay. Uh, so what we did was a calculation of Compton of reflected spectra from stellar atmosphere, from excess illuminated stellar atmospheres. Now, the idea is to look at binary systems where one of the binaries is a compact object or tries to start to be a compact object. And there is an accretion disk or accretion column around it. And the X-rays are uh, coming out. Now, many X-rays when which we detect at uh, at uh, the Earth are uh, have already been scattered from the companion. And uh, this is the stellar atmosphere that we talk about the companion to the compact star, yes, uh, where the X is uh, illuminated and we measure here at Earth the reflected spectra. So we did, uh, we started to do calculation. Now, of course, this is not a solid state material. Uh, this is uh, mainly plasma and other things. And uh, of course, uh, Ruben, uh, I, I must confess, uh, I didn't have any education in astrophysics before. He was my teacher, uh, actually. And uh, he uh, immediately, uh, he, what he suggested was what materials to put in the stellar atmosphere, uh, how much atoms of each, how much uh, elements of each, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, density, et cetera. And uh, we could calculate the whole thing, including multiple scattering. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you go into the, to the star, uh, you get uh, a lot of multiple scattering. And uh, OK, this was a very, Apparently, this was a very good paper because it was cited many, many times in the future, until now even, I saw. Okay, then, uh, so that was uh, what we did in, in astrophysics actually in uh, the Technon. However, in, uh, after a f uh, some years, actually 10 years after he left, uh, we decided that we must do something more. And I came to San Paulo even twice. I came to San Paulo around 1989. And uh, we applied this same idea to more uh, specifically to some objects. Actually, uh, yes, uh, here is one uh, X-ray from accretion column of compact objects a Monte Carlo study. Uh, here, uh, Ruben is already from uh, San Paulo, if you see. And uh, 
this was, uh, I went to this conference, if you can see above, it's a 23rd ES Lab Symposium on two topics in X-ray astronomy in Bologna, Italy, uh, 1988 and 89, and I went there myself and uh, presented this uh, later on the same subject, uh, on the work that we did in San Paolo when I was there visiting him twice. Uh, he, he published also a paper in, a Mexican, in the Mexican journal that you see above, uh, Revisita Mexicana Astronomica and Astrophysica, whatever it is. And you see as again, uh, it was again uh, X-ray spectrum for accretion counts of magnetic white dwarfs. Uh, so uh, with results that uh, also apparently they were, uh, they got a got lot of interest. Later uh, in the, from the same meetings, uh, we worked also on, uh, ad, uh, in, on X-rays that come from the, from the area surrounding active galactic nuclei. And uh, apparently in, in 1989 or 70, 90, 1990, 1990 uh, there was an, a conference in Italy again, but in uh, Lago di Como, uh, of uh, iron line diagnostics in X-ray sources. And uh, here you can see the paper that we submitted there was X-ray spectra from clouds in active galactic nuclei. And again, work that we did together when Ruben was in San Paolo. And uh, if you see here that uh, the clouds are clouds, uh, the, the X-rays come from, of course, from material that accretes and finally goes into the black hole, but, uh, but uh, uh, then when, it, uh, but it comes back because it uh, scatters from clouds uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the black hole. And uh, we calculated, especially what was interesting at that time, I, I will not show you the graphs, but, uh, one thing was the, uh, one important thing was how the, uh, oh, let me see, again, how the iron line shows uh, up in this. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, this was of interest to astrophysicists uh, because uh, according to the iron line, uh, they could infer on many, uh, properties of the uh, uh, compact object. Uh, okay, so this was uh, that, and uh, okay. Uh, I finished that. Uh, do I have a bit more time or it's enough? Uh, yeah, we're a bit late, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I have two, one, uh, one, two, one minute. Uh, uh, he did with, uh, we, I did with him also another work in 19, when he started in 1978, almost when he, he left. And was really, this was really experimental work. And uh, uh, we also got this idea of a, a millimeter wave radiation measurement, uh, uh, which, were, uh, which were sensitive to glow discharge plasma. And uh, what, what was the reason is because Jay Pol uh, J uh, Jacob Polich, Polich, the one that in between us in the names, uh, was a, 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 a engineer that worked in our department. And he worked in these millimeter waves uh, for a long time. And uh, he asked us to help to see, to try to see if we can uh, measure the these millimeter waves with glow discharge plasma. So uh, this was uh, uh, done. Uh, that was published in Applied Physics Letters in seventy eight. Uh, in seventy eight, and the, the last thing I want to show is that after that, after he left 
or actually not, in 79 years after he left, uh, Ruben still published with him this uh, a more extensive work on this millimeter wave detection uh, in a glow discharge tube in a magnetic field. What was important here that we found that uh, in the, uh, under cyclotron resonance, the detection of uh, uh, the millimeter waves was by far higher than otherwise. Uh, what was also happened after that, this is on a personal note, is that uh, I, uh, since that was with working with plasma, first of all, I worked with uh, Ruben also on, on plasma of, uh, in astrophysics, because most of the material is plasma when we scatter photons from it. But uh, I, uh, like this idea of working with plasma after that, because the globe discharge plasma and later we, I continued with plasma for almost the rest of my career. And, uh, but not in plasma astrophysics, except what I talked with, I worked with Ruben, but he's one of the reasons that uh, I started to, I changed my career to work with plasma. And right now I consider myself more a plasma physicist. But that's, I am now a professor emeritus anyways, and I try to do work, still work, but I think that's enough. Uh, you see that uh, Ruben was really versatile and full of uh, surprises. Every time he thought in another thing and with original ideas, just uh, amazing. That's it. Thank, thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, so, um, um, Rav, Mihal, do you want to comment or anyone wants to comment on before the break? Maybe one, uh, uh, one comment, uh, Yeshua, you, you said uh, Ruven had uh, all these ideas and was uh, creative. Uh, later in the end of uh, uh, my uh, um, in the end of his career when he uh, when he went to work in my group, my main, and I work in photonics and solid state. I mean, yes, physics is physics, but it's really not, was not his era, but he was easily able to. Yes, he, 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 was, he could work in any area. <laughs> exactly, could work in any area. So my goal is I wanted to make sure that my students graduate. So I, so I, I, I kept every day. I said, "Abba, Dad, realistic. Be realistic," <laughs> because he used to throw crazy ideas uh, on the students, and I, I, I always had to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> no. uh, just, I'm sorry about uh, that. I had some problems with the English in, in the middle of my talk because I'm too excited. <laughs> No, your show was perfect, perfect. Shua and Steve, I was so okay. grateful for, for this, for both of you. I sometimes forgot a word until I remembered it. <laughs> no, so grateful. So we can continue talking, but I propose to start uh, next uh, at 11.20, okay? I leave everything open and people can still talk. But then Zulema and Jacques, they start at uh, 11.20. Is that okay? In 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay? Ten. Okay. This is a way to meet people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I just make one remark? Sure. Yeah, I just uh, uh, well, regarding that very sensitive Michelson Morley experiment, which, which we did together, I remember now that uh, one of the problems with it was that it also acted as a seism seismometer measuring changes, uh, movements of the ground and so on. And we discovered that it was sufficiently sensitive to tell the state of the beach, the water of the, of the waves on the beach in Haifa. We were on the top of Mount Carmel at a height of, of 200 meters high. And the, the, down below was the beach. And every time a wave hit the beach, we could see it on the interferometer. It was amazingly sensitive. Wow. Oh, <laughs> that patented it. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> Did you say that it weighed uh, six tons? Sorry? The weight weighed, no, three and a half tons. Three and yeah. a half tons yeah. was the weight of this plate, and it was sitting on the pole of mercury. <laughs> These days, they wouldn't allow you to do it in the lab any longer, with so much mercury around. In so what, those days, what happened to this instrument afterwards? I don't know. I really don't know what happened to it afterwards because it was, you know, the long period where his lab was there and everyone was saying, where's Ruvin? Because he was for, for four years, his lab was still waiting for him to come back. And then he didn't come back. And this, I suppose someone threw it away eventually. <laughs> and, and how about this Cockcroft Co Co Walton accelerator that he bought? Do you know anything about it? Well, they, they, that was there for many years. And it was eventually the department, the, that field was closed down and, uh, um, and the laboratory went over to, to um, who, who's working there now, uh, I've forgotten who's working there now. I think it's, I think it, oh, it's atomic force microscopy. So, but it was there for a long time, long time. Incredible. Actually, I think the last time I was at the Technion, I visited the department. Uh, they want they showed me the area where the lab was, but I think yeah. it was so renovated that. That's I right. Even, yeah. It's been changed. It's been re rebuilt because you know, the space is it's, it's the ground floor, and that's very valuable for anything which would be great sensitivity because it's much more stable than being on the fifth floor, or the sixth floor. Yeah. So that, that space had to be used, for, as I said, for atomic force microscopy. I must say that that experiment, when he used to talk about his work in general, I would say that that experiment was perhaps the closest to his heart because it, mm -hmm. it was, yeah, because it was the wildest. <laughs> <laughs> he said a full table of mercury and we would have gotten that constant and it was it was just bold and wild and yeah yeah, yeah it was it was uh, it was a, a great hope to i mean if, if he had uh, if, if they found us this connection with the rotation then that would have been a nobel prize i'm sure because it would have defied the, the theory of relativity yeah yeah. But as they say, we did two orders of magnitude better than Michaels and Morley and found that they were right. Yeah. yeah. I think the fact that what uh, Yeshua, what you mentioned, that uh, he had this idea of the Compton, right? His first idea of the. Uh, 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 to study the uh, the quantum scattering, and basically uh, later on, he realized that other people have already started. That was at least in my group when he was uh, with me. That was I always that that was always a, uh, uh, a, a friction friction, but the, you know funny funny and warm friction. Uh, he came with his wild idea. Said, "Abba." Who else did it? Because he because he was so uh, excited about so many topics, uh, and he thought that they were so cool that uh, he didn't have patience with the details. Uh, he just wanted uh, to explore these big ideas. And it doesn't matter if someone else did it a little bit here, a little bit there. It doesn't matter. The idea is amazing, and we should you know we should pursue. <laughs> Well, uh, can I say, can I say a word? Sure. Yes, uh, let me, let me just give uh, some, uh, some witness of, of this enthusiasm for physics, because uh, probably, probably his daughters do not remember me, but uh, I was one of the first people that uh, he had met when he came to Brazil in 1979. I do remember. Uh, he was uh, a student at Gram. Um, and I remember, uh, well, how he, he talked about uh, general relativity and Rosen's theory, and that struck me uh, in such a way that, uh, 
that changed my, my perspective. Uh, I was struggling to learn the relativity and general relativity, and suddenly I'm told that uh, you can build a theory, uh, an alternative theory out of scratch and uh, test it. For me, that was, uh, that was a revelation, okay? And on the top of that, uh, he had this idea of uh, coherent detection of uh, cosmic uh, neutrinos, and he gave talks, and I remember he, he carried the detector on the, on the pocket of his shirt, and he said, well, this is the material that you are going to use to detect this cosmic radiation of neutrino. And I, I mean, you were, I was a, a second year, a third, passing third year student, and uh, uh, I, I was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, mind blowing. And, uh, I remember, well, that for me was uh, very, very amazing. And then um, a few months later, I was already uh, caught by particle physics and uh, I met him uh, by chance. I was not attending uh, a CRAM anymore. I was interested in particle physics. And he told me, what are you doing these days? And I was telling him, him that was extremely excited about uh, dimensional regularization on which you, you do the calculations slightly off four dimensions and then uh, suddenly you <laughs> put this parameter equal to zero and you capture the, the infinity. And he said, oh, this is so exciting. I never heard about it. This is, this is amazing. So the particle physicists are doing these things these days. I said, well, it looks like <laughs> they do. And he was extremely excited uh, about this, uh, this idea that uh, many people would consider somewhat crazy, but uh, uh, in particle physics, that was a hit. I mean, that was an extremely, extremely powerful way of capturing infinities. And uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, just to uh, just point out that uh, uh, Hooven had uh, these uh, amazing, amazing enthusiasm for physics. And, uh, uh, well, I, I can say more later on, but uh, uh, I was extremely pleased when uh, he invited me in 2004 uh, to attend the, 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 the new physics at Campus du Jordan. Uh, we haven't seen each other for, for many, many years. In fact, I recollect that we've met briefly in 1997, in Marcel Grothman meeting in Jerusalem, um, it was uh, it was great fun to, to, to see each other. And, and uh, 1994, 2004 onwards, uh, I was going regularly to Campus du Jordan, uh, and uh, it was always a uh, great fun to to talk with him and to uh, the, during the meals. And uh, well, there, there were some occasions on which my my, my, my father and my, my sister came over and uh, we had a very, very lively discussion about several things. And uh, so it was quite a fun. Okay. So but the, the amazing thing about Hooving was, uh, uh, yeah. let me close with this, was his creativity. He was an amazingly creative person. Okay, and uh, uh, when we met, uh, it was always a great fun, a great fun because uh, 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 I remember that in Jerusalem, uh, uh, Marcelo Schiffer uh, caught us uh, joking and uh, he said, well, why are you talking in, in English with each other? And uh, he told me, well, because I, I, I love or feel uh, British accent, okay? And I told him that, uh, well, I love your American accent, okay? So that's why we're talking in. So it was always a great fun, really, really always a great fun. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, we have more. We have more time for people to uh, give testimonies at the end. So please uh, feel free to do it. Well, so I'll, now I'll, we... try to, I'll try to stay. Uh, we are in a crisis here because you know you are in the middle of pandemic and uh, we have exams and things like that. So I may I may come and go, but uh, I'll try to be as much as I can. Thanks. So now now we go for Zulema and Jacques. So they're going to uh, talk about. Uh, the, uh, um, the first years of offer in Brazil. Okay, I try to share my screen. You should be able to. Let me see. Como é, César? This one? E agora? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay? Can you see it? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Let me put it here. Hello. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It, it's it's a, an honor to 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 talk uh, in this meeting. And uh, well, what I wanted to tell you is the first uh, years of um, of offer in Brazil when he was a radio astronomer. And I must say that I learned lots of things from you. So in my talk, I will mention the things that I didn't know and I know now. So offer came to Brazil by the end of 1978. And he was invited by Pierre Kaufman to work with his group in solar physics. Uh, but that time, at Apetinga Radio Observatory that you can see in here, uh, was uh, now it's called Pierre Kaufman Observatory, was recently inaugurated. And the radio astronomy group had been recently transferred from Mackenzie University to the National Observatory, and that at that time belonged to St. PQ. And Pierre Kaufman was interested in solar physics, uh, and his group had started to make observations at 22 gigahertz with high temporal resolution, and they were pioneers in the discovery of flares with millisecond time scale. And that's Rogerio is the reason why the citations are so high, because really that was a, a something that was discovered at Itapetinga. So um, the idea of, uh, from Pierre was that offer uh, was going to work in the theoretical interpretation in the solar of the solar flares. And there was another question also that now I know that is uh, this uh, glow discharge to cube. Um, that uh, could be used in, as a detector for radio astronomy. And in principle, offer was going to work with engineers in it, but nothing can, came out of it. I don't know if, uh, because Itapetinga is not very sensitive at uh, 70 gigahertz, the atmosphere is very bad, or because the receiver was not good, I don't know. But, um, Called offer came to Brazil to work in solar physics. At that time in the uh, 70s, the astronomers were interested in the new, newly discovered molecular lines, especially in the water um, vapor masers in space, which also were which were also observed at the Tapetinga. So offer became interested in the water masers, and now I know why, because he was interested in everything. And he proposed an observational project. He wanted to observe high velocity lines in the water sources. And these lines uh, are very weak relative to the lines that have systemic velocity, uh, uh, the systemic velocity of the, of the sources. So since Sofa didn't have any experience in as an observer in radio astronomy, Pierre Kaufman asked me to help him with the observation. And it was in this way that Offer and myself discovered the strongest water maser flare that it ever occurred in the Orion Nebula. And that's the second uh, paper that uh, Rogerio mentioned, the uh, water maser uh, paper. So I'm going to tell you how this discovery was made, and some stories, queer stories about uh, this, uh, the observations. Okay. So as I said, the, offer, the sources that offer wanted to observe uh, were very weak, uh, and um, it was very difficult to observe in with the room temperature receiver that we have at that time. So we waited for an observing campaign that uh, used a receiver cooled with liquid helium. That's something new at that time. Uh, the problem is that the receiver was not closed cycle. 
So the helium evaporated and was collected in a huge balloon, balloon was transferred to cylinders and sent to the University of Sao Paulo to be liquefied and returned to Itapetinga. It's about 60 kilometers from there. So to, to, for, for, to use this receiver, uh, we have special campaigns. They lasted for about two weeks in which all the group, including uh, our families, maybe Miraf and Michal will remember that. Absolutely. We moved to the observatory and divided observing time. So the first thing I did uh, in this campaign was to verify if everything was wor working properly. And to do that, I observed the water masers in the well-known Orion Nebula. Uh, the spectrum of the sources was obtained with a multi-channel spectrograph, which had only 31 uh, channels, but there were independent channels. And uh, they have a velocity resolution of 1.3 kilometers per second. And these uh, maser sources were very narrow uh, lines. So when I pointed to Orion, one of the channels gave a very strong signal. In fact, it was saturated, so I didn't know how much it was. That happens sometimes. Uh, one of the channels went wrong. Uh, but just in case, I changed the central frequency of the receiver uh, and the strong signal moved to another channel. So it was not a channel, it was a real source in the sky. So the, this observation was made in the middle of the night. So I waited until the next day to tell offer and especially the engineers to see what could be done with the receiver. And one of them, Jorge Raffaelli, installed an attenuator in the receiver. So next night we were able to measure the signal with precision. And we followed the source during all the time it was about the horizon. and verified that the change in a sinusoidal form. And we concluded that the variation should be due to linear polarization, but the receiver could measure only one component of the polarized radiation. So what we did, well, let me tell you how the uh, detector worked. A detector had uh, two rectangular horns, as you can see here. And in radio astronomy, the horns measure one, only one of the directions of the polarized radiation. In this horn, for example, is in the direction of the minor uh, side of the rectangle, of the rectangular horn, in the vertical direction. Uh, and the two horns had the same sense of, detected the same sense of polarization. And as the source moves in the sky, this is uh, in the um, vertical direction all the time. So as the source moves in space, the projection of the polarized uh, radiation change. And that's the reason of the variability we detected that night. Uh, but what did they do, the two horns? Uh, the, one of them observed observe sky plus the source, and the other one only the source, so only the sky. So the difference between them was the signal of the source. So what we did is to change the sense of one of the horns so we could measure vertical and horizontal polarization. We that, did that after the two weeks of campaign uh, when we went back to the normal receiver and we observed the source with offer every day. Uh, we took turns of several days each and so here comes the story I want to tell you about the observations. Uh, at that time, it, at, in Tapetinga, we didn't have phones. So to make a call, we have to go to the city of Atibaya. 
So we we did we were not in touch with each other all the time. So after we started our regular observations, I arrived at the observatory one day after Ofter had already left and found everybody excited say, saying that Ofer had measured very fast variability in the maser signal. Yes, I'm always skeptical about how the observations are made. I checked with the technical staff what could ha had happened. And we discovered that when they change the orientation of the horns, they remove a thin film that covers the entrance of the horn and forgot to put it back. <laughs> so they went to see what happened at, at the focus of the radio telescope and they found a bee or a, a wasp, I don't know what it was, inside the horn. When it moved, the measure signal changed. This is fantastic. So I went back to Sao Paulo after my turn of observations, and I found that Offer had already proposed a theory to help to explain the variability. Unfortunately, we could not use it because it was not uh, real. We published the results of one year of observations in which the intensity increased by a factor of 100 and the polarization reached more than 50%. And if I must tell you that uh, maser sources have a few percent of polar, polarization. That's the only source that had that kind of polarization. Uh, so this is the paper we published, the giant outburst of the eight kilometers per second water measure feature in Orion. Uh, that's the observation. The source afterwards uh, was even stronger. And in here you have the polarization degree as a function of, of the flux density. You see the flux density is about a million chance. So it was something amazing. So okay, so as Rogerio said, sometime in the 1980s, the radio astronomy group separated. Some of us went with Pierre Kaufman and the radio telescope to INPE, and others, including Offer, remain at on end. So this is the way the involvement of Offer in radio astronomy ended. Uh, as Rogerio said, he went to, uh, uh, to Rio. He commuted uh, to Rio all the time uh, and then came back uh, and was uh, got a contract at uh, uh, the astronomy department of the uh, University of Sao Paulo. So that's my the end of my talk, probably Jacques will tell you what happened after we separated because that was also the end of our collaboration. It was not the end of our friendship. I must say that I remember very well uh, the good time we had with the uh, offer, both when uh, he was at uh, at Brown with, uh, as a radio astronomer, or, and also uh, as now um, when he was at the University of Sao Paulo and I uh, started to work there also. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zulema. That was amazing. Uh, this Can I just add, add one thing, little, little thing to Zulema? As yes. my, my memory is in Atibaya is a family of frogs because the, the family will be there to observe. And I remember as a, you know, a little girl terrified of this big, you know, big mama frog with her kids waiting before you go into the observatory. <laughs> well, you were lucky. You were lucky because you haven't met the snakes. Yes, yes true. Cascavels there, okay. I, I, I came across a cascavel there, okay. So uh, <laughs> you were very lucky. <laughs> My association with radio astronomy was the frogs. We have we have to to feed you because your father and mother were were 
observing at night. So in the morning when I was not observing, <laughs> I gave you breakfast. <laughs> Why I'm not surprised. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, Wait to so, see you, Zulema. Okay, thank you very much, Zulema. So now, Jack, you can uh, share your screen if you want. Okay, let me share the screen. If I if I uh, succeed. And let me make this um, bigger. I don't know if I succeed to, to make it bigger or, or not. Let's say. Uh, you can put in presentation mode. Sorry? You can put in presentation mode. Yes. Presentation. Uh, the bottom, uh, you there, can huh? In the bottom, you have a place you can you put the whole screen uh, okay annotation well, 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 well. Uh, okay, over <laughs> there on the right the right one the right, the right one. no the right 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 the last key Jackie why a girator your bottom of girator in basho in basho my spagirator my spagirator by my spagirator Para a direita, para o outro lado. Vai, vai para o outro lado. Você está indo para a esquerda. Está aqui, ponto, 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 vai. Agora. Agora, é esse. Aí. Ok. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, I never uh, worked really in science with, with Ruben. I, I, I was not anymore a student, but I attended so, some of, of his courses, like uh, plasma physics and uh, uh, cosmology and things like that. But we were uh, good friends and we, we were often in Atibaya and uh, in many, many other places, all these meetings. Uh, of the Brazilian uh, Astronomical Society, we, we were we were together, and uh, so it is uh, here a, a view of the radio telescope at at a given moment when the the dome was being changed so that we could uh, have a view. But you see that it is a very nice place. It is green. There is grass and uh, offer often uh, came with uh, his family with the Rela, Mihal, Mihal, and uh, uh, the, uh, when it was during weekends. So we, we had very pleasant uh, times uh, there. This is at 60 kilometers from, from Sao Paulo. Now, about his uh, Maybe there is something lacking. Uh, arrived in Brazil in 1980. He came from, from Israel directly here to, to, to Brazil. And he was invited by, by Pierre Kaufman, uh, who was the director of the Center for Radio Astronomy of Mackenzie. But it is a, a complicated story. I have to explain a little. Kram, uh, was a group of radio astronomy of Mackenzie University. But uh, in reality, Ruben never worked at, at Mackenzie University since his first job was at Observatorio Nacional. Observatorio Nacional is a, a national institute with headquarters in, in Rio de Janeiro. So in, in 1977, the Mackenzie uh, university was not uh, willing to support anymore the, a, a radio astronomy group, and this is why the, the group was absorbed by the Observatorio Nacional. But Observatorio Nacional was in Rio, and is, there was nothing in Sao Paulo. Observatorio Nacional rented the house not, not far from, from the Mackenzie University in uh, Para, uh, Rua Pará. So this was the first place where uh, Ruben uh, worked in Brazil, in this uh, palace. So this is the, before this. 
about the first scientific activities. I, I went to, to the ADS list of work to see the, the real ones. He, he has a paper with uh, Federico Strauss, uh, Pierre Kauf, and uh, on the solar, solar, solar variability. So you, you can see maybe here behind, uh, or, or I come back. Uh, and he, he was interested in, in the oscillation. In reality, Pierre Kaufman uh, was a, a solar, uh, solar radio solar, and he, his interest in collaboration with Ruben Offer was uh, precisely on these things, to observe the sun and to, to see uh, variations, oscillations, because Pierre Kaufman was convinced that was, he had a, a theory which was not uh, accepted by, by, by all of, about these, uh, these oscillations. At the end, uh, Offer, Ruben Offer, worked not so much with, with Pierre Kaufman. He was uh, not very convinced also with his uh, questions that Pierre Kaufman wanted to, to attack. And, and, and another important work he, that he published is this giant outburst of the measure of Orion that uh, Zulema just told uh, about that. And when he, come, he came to, to, to Brazil, he had still a desire to develop technology. This was this question of, of the, let's just say, blue discharge tube. He talked in, uh, about this uh, with me several times, how he could uh, try to, to make ones, to develop that, and let's say. But it was uh, something uh, a little complicated in, in the structure that we have, because you have to make this lamp with magnetic field applied to it, and. Uh, to, 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 to send the radio waves I need to test. So it was a, a, a kind of, uh, of big effort of uh, technology. And we somewhat uh, decided not, not, not to do it, let's say. Uh, this is the control room of the observatory. So, uh, Ruben has uh, worked a lot in this, in this uh, room. Now I have just to finish some sad stories. In uh, 1979, uh, the last days, the, the radio telescope was transferred from Observatory Nacional to INPE. But this was made in a kind of violent way, so that 50% of the team decided not to accept this. Uh, and this is not only the scientists, we also uh, secretaries and technicians, and it was, it was the most horrible division of a group in two groups, uh, and the consequences are still there now, 40 years after. I think that radio astronomy never became what it was before. So the radio astronomy group was divided in two groups, one belonging to Observatorio Nacional and the other to, to INPE. And Ruben Offer uh, stayed in the group of Observatorio Nacional, and me too. Now, but the problem is, let's say, for a, for a while, the Observatorio Nacional kept his, his group in Sao Paulo. But after a, a change of director again and, and uh, in, in Rio, uh, we decided to close the radio astronomy group in Sao Paulo. And so Ruben was forced to, to go to Rio, but, uh, but he was not willing to, to go and live in Rio. He had his family here in Sao Paulo. And so his, uh, during a time, he, he was going three, three days per week uh, in Rio and then returning to, to Sao Paulo. This lasted some six months because a place became, uh, a position became available at ERG. We, we were fortunate at that time that, let's say, the rector of the university 
ao São Paulo, é, do Guerra Vieira, o Acefal é um astrônomo que, que got his PhD thesis with a Nancy uh, radio telescope in France. So he was in some way willing to, to protect, let's say, the, the radio astronomers. And uh, he, he got position for, for some four, four people uh, at TLG. And so uh, Ruben and me were two, two of, 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 of these people who, who moved. Others were uh, Maria Alcina Braz and uh, our engineer, Jorge Rafael. And, uh, <clears throat> but the, the position became available for me very, uh, uh, let's say, immediately, because I decided to, to leave Observatorio Nacional. But uh, Ruben was afraid to leave uh, his position at, at Observatorio Nacional before he had his position totally guaranteed in New York. This is why he stayed this, this long time uh, going to to and, and back. So this is why uh, what I, I wanted to to talk about, and uh, thank you all for for the invitation. Thank you, Jacques. So... Jackie, I just had one little comment that I remember so well: the control room of Itajubar. Oh, this is it's amazing. I love to see the picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any any other comments? Okay, um, so, so we're not that late. So, uh, so now uh, uh, Betty and Vera are going to talk about uh, 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 Ruben Ofer as a, as a uh, supervisor. So I think, Betty, you can share your screen, right? Let me check. Yes, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? No, I can't. Yep. Can you? For some reason, I can't. I cannot. No, no, not yet. Oh, no. Not yet? Oh, let me see what's going on. Because I, I put shared screen. Oh, okay. Now I think no. you... Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So as a matter of fact, I was, uh, I was asked to, to talk on behalf of all offers exe students so i'm uh, i will i will uh, try to to uh, to to say a few words uh, about offer as a supervisor in brazil right and um, okay uh, you you have seen already uh, you know uh, how offer was uh, so broad-minded in science, and uh, he started with the nuclear physics. Then uh, he inaugurated in Brazil plasma astrophysics. Uh, astrophysics actually, he introduced plasma astrophysics in Brazil, and also uh, primordial plasmas uh, in the cosmological context. And he published over 160 papers uh, since his earlier career. And in Brazil, he advised uh, 13 PhD students and six master uh, uh, students, uh, as uh, Rogério emphasized uh, before. And um, uh, his students at the AG USP are here uh, listed. And uh, there are a few uh, picture, uh, there are pictures from most of them, not all of them, but most of them. So for instance, uh, here you can see uh, Merav, of course. M Merav, actually, she was not uh, an official student of, of, of offer, but she, she worked with him a lot. And uh, here, José Carlos de Araújo, myself, of Adriana Valio, Vera Jatenko, and uh, uh, Canali, João Batista Canali. Here again, Juan Batista Canali, uh, uh, Daniel Müller, Vera, uh, Oswaldo Miranda, myself, Adriana, 
uh, Gustavo Medina Tanco, Ofe, uh, Nilza Pires, and here are some others, uh, Luis Carlos Jafelici and um, Rafael uh, Alves da Silva. And uh, back in 2012, we had this um, uh, celebrate, celebration of uh, Offer's eighth birthday uh, during the New Physics in Space workshop, these workshops that Offer uh, organized himself. And um, some people will talk about these workshops later on in this conference as well. But uh, during this, meet, this meeting in 2012, we had the opportunity of celebrating his uh, birthday and we paid him a tribute at, there with the testimonies of most of his students, not all of them because uh, uh, just a few of us were attending the meeting. Some uh, sent their testimonies as well. And uh, you can see here offer uh, cutting the cake. And he was very moved with this uh, celebration, with this um, um, tribute because he was not actually expecting this. But uh, then I, I, I took some extracts of the testimonies that were uh, presented uh, in, this, uh, in this celebration. And I will describe them in the next few slides. So uh, these extracts, I, I try to, to, to select the highlights of these uh, different testimonies. And let me describe some of these highlights. So Jafelici, besides showing the number of papers that he produced during his PhD with offer and his supervision, of course, uh, uh, these papers were on uh, extragalactic jets and uh, plasma phenomena associated to or produced within extragalactic relativistic jets and uh, uh, also uh, relativistic jets as a way to produce seed magnetic fields in the intergalactic medium. This was, I, I may say that nowadays, this is a, a common, a, a, a standard uh, a mechanism, but that, that, at that time, this was, you know, uh, uh, an, brand new ideas. So, uh, but besides showing uh, uh, the works themselves, uh, Jafelis uh, highlighted, emphasized how profound physicist offer was. Uh, and I, I know that by this time, nobody has any doubt on this, according to the testimonies, the, the talks that we have had so far. And uh, he, he also highlighted the fact that offer was always ready to try to establish, you know, these interconnections between different phenomena that apparently had no, no connection with each other, but at the end, the physics uh, of, the, of the process should be explained in a similar way. So he, he was uh, very, very, um, very smart on that, right? So this was something that we students, we could realize since the, the beginning of our of our connection of our uh, relationship with him as as an advisor, and uh, José Carlos de Araújo, with José Carlos he started he really introduced uh, uh, plasma physics in primordial plasmas in cosmology here in Brazil because they started wor working on uh, first stars uh, you know in, in in, in the origin of first stars in the primordial universe and um, uh, the role that these stars could play on producing uh, voids, their relations with the big voids. Again, uh, 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 you know, it, it is nowadays, this is uh, one of the processes that is commonly discussed and uh, simulated, but at that time, you know, this was a, a pioneering work. And with Vera, uh, Vera actually, uh, sh she did her PhD with Offer, but then she kept working. Uh, so they were partners in, in science uh, uh, until Offer, uh, almost until Offer moved back to uh, the United States. And uh, in her PhD with Offer, they produced 
four, 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 they published four papers on, on uh, 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 the effects of alpha waves in, in, the, in the winds of, uh, of uh, stellar winds, actually, um, alpha wave dumping in heating and accelerating stellar winds. And uh, later on, they kept uh, uh, um, applying these ideas and alpha waves and um, uh, the uh, alpha wave dumping process in different astrophysical objects. And um, uh, with Osvaldo Miranda, he uh, resumed the subject on, on first stars and the production of voids and magnetogenesis as well. So uh, the first supernovae produced in these uh, primordial stars in the universe, the role of uh, supernovae explosions in, in spreading and um, uh, amplifying magnetic fields, seed magnetic fields, uh, which, is, which was also uh, a pioneering uh, 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 work uh, in, in the 90s. And um, with uh, João Batista Canali, João actually did his, both his master and PhD with Offer. They published uh, seven papers uh, during this time, and it was exactly on um, X-ray binary systems. So the the ideas that um, that uh, were mentioned late, uh, early early on in uh, well uh, in in this uh, workshop um, about polarization and uh, Compton radiation and its association uh, with the uh, binary systems, and, uh, its application to, to astrophysical sources, then he was resuming these subjects along with his students uh, here in Brazil later on. And um, with Gustavo Medina Tanco, he, uh, Gustavo did his uh, PhD with Offer. Um, he came from Argentina to do so, to work on, uh, and then they started uh, studying particle acceleration and propagation in, in, in astrophysical environments uh, with uh, both theory and numerical simulations. And Gustavo highlighted the fact that his, uh, their very first paper, I mean, his very first paper was accepted in two weeks only when they submitted this paper on particle acceleration to astronomy and astrophysics. It was accepted by the referee of Fork, who is a, a, an expertise on particle acceleration. And uh, so Gustavo was very happy because, you know, he thought it was his first paper. So he thought that it would be uh, that easy uh, every time, <laughs> forever. But then, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, they published another paper on particle acceleration, a very on, on, on numerical simulations. And then they, they moved into another subject involving turbulence. In, in molecular clouds, and um, they try to 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 uh, explain the origin of turbulence. The first object that was uh, in which outside the the Milky Way in which turbulence was observed, um, it, it was a molecular cloud in in, in the Magellanic clouds, and and then this he he he, he emphasized that this paper took almost two years to be accepted. <laughs> So, you know, it's not that easy to explore new ideas to uh, uh, ideas in, ahead of, of, of the time. Sometimes it, it, get, it gets too, too difficult to, to publish. We faced this as well, but anyways. So, Nilza Pires. Uh, 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 Nilza, uh, she did her PhD with Offer in 1994 on a, a, a project that was related to the cosmological constant. So in 90, nowadays cosmological constant, you know, if you, if you Google cosmological constant, there are zillions of works on that after, after the discovery of uh, the accelerated um, expansion of the universe, right? But at, at, at that time, the, the cosmological constant, it was uh, uh, like a, 
a formal a formal uh, subject that just a few would tackle and then they 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 tackled this uh, uh, in order to try to explain the formation of first structures in the universe including the cosmological models the 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 cosmological constant the cosmological term right so again with the exotic ideas and challenging you know uh, themselves in in, in new subjects. With Daniel Miller, uh, uh, offer went even deeply because they explored pre-inflationary universe models. And uh, with Merav, okay, uh, Merav will talk uh, a lot more, I guess, uh, uh, about her, her work. I like the picture, Betty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too, me too. It's, it's lovely, really. So, but, you know, Mirava, I, I took this, these extracts from, from the testimonies that you, that you uh, presented, that you sent to me uh, in 2012, right, when I presented this, um, this uh, tribute, uh, this presentation in, in, in Offer's tribute. Uh, but anyways, in the eighth birthday. But anyways, what I would like to highlight here that Mirav pointed out was, okay, besides the fact that they produced together uh, seven papers well, during her early career, uh, uh, her early career, really early because it was during her PhD, on, on several subjects on fundamental plasma astrophysics, and uh, they even published uh, physical review letters. Uh, um, um, and, uh, but what I would like to emphasize is, is, is these points that we, we know already uh, after all these talks of this morning, that uh, um, Offer <clears throat> was always trying to seek out to, 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 to follow or to, 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 to explore uh, uh, new ideas and uh, sometimes ahead of, of his time. And um, always with, uh, without a fear of, you know, of jumping into these uh, new subjects and uh, pushing us into them, right? And uh, okay, with, the, um, with the Rafael, uh, they explored magnetogenesis uh, or the origin of cosmic magnetic fields uh, in the universe. And um, well, with myself, okay, I was, uh, I was among one, uh, his first students are, are most of those that I have just described, whose testimonies I have just described. And uh, in my, I did my PhD with offer and on this subject, I mean, talking about exotic, strange, new ideas. <laughs> we, we, we explored thermal instabilities in non-thermal compact sources. So can you believe this, how hard it was to, to explore this theme? Uh, but still we, we managed to produce uh, five, uh, five refereed papers in the major journals, Astrophysical Journal, Monthly Notes, Astronomy and Astrophysics. And um, uh, one that I would like to, uh, to highlight here is this a possible origin of superluminal knots. So in this, we uh, again offer with his, you, you know, his ideas, his former, his former ideas on how to produce superluminal apparent, superluminal motion, etc. It happens that apparently superluminal motion is observed in relativistic jets, right? And uh, there are ways to explain different mechanisms proposed, uh, but uh, we proposed this brand new one where we could produce naturally produce the superluminal, apparent superluminal knots or motion of, uh, of structures within the jets with the thermal instabilities. A crazy idea of, you know, <laughs> very hard to people to, to buy it, but again, uh, very challenging and very motivating working on these topics. But what I really would like to emphasize or highlight here uh, is offers uh, the, 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 uh, the major of, officers, uh, offers legacy to me, to us actually, to all of us, his ex-students, his students. And uh, I, I, I took 
uh, this, uh, this, uh, these words uh, that I wrote in Offer's uh, memorial page. And uh, I, uh, this is uh, my feeling uh, uh, regarding science. What I learned from him, of course, I learned a lot with Offer, who first introduced plasma astrophysics to me. Uh, with his everlasting contagious in enthusiasm in science. But perhaps the most important lesson I got from him uh, was that he was always encouraging us to think and act with an open mind in science, to be broad-minded, as he used to say, you should be broad-minded, to seek out for new challenges trying to figure out how a physical process could have applicability in a broad context or scales from laboratory and stars to cosmological scales. This is something I always valued deeply and I try, have tried and try always to teach to my own students. We really try or have tried so far to continue his legacy. And um, as such, um, oh, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I've been uh, uh, developing with the, my group of students and postdocs, uh, different subjects on plasma and magnetohydrodynamics, and actually most of us, his ex his students, explore these different subjects, trying to, to be broad-minded as he pushed me in this direction. So for instance, we have been exploring uh, dynamos, the origin of magnetic fields from stars to primordial universe, magnetogenesis, both theoretically and numerically, all these subjects, star formation, turbulence, and magnetic field connections, um, uh, the origin and the physics process associated to black hole sources, compact sources in general, accretion just discs and thus relativistic and uh, supersonic jets, the evolution of galaxies and the feedback of black holes and star formation into, in, into the evolution of these galaxies, and also explored the origin of the first structures in the universe, in, in, or in other words, exploring the primordial universe. And in all these uh, 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 scales and uh, astrophysical systems and environments, we have been studying or exploring fundamental plasma phenomena, such as particle acceleration, magnetogenesis, turbulence, plasma instability, high energy phenomena, gamma rays and neutrino uh, physics. And because of this, uh, of this um, let's say, of this knowledge or, 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 um, on high energy phenomena, we have been invited to participate of the Cherenkov Telescope Array collaboration for the construction of the largest gamma ray observatory uh, that will uh, have 100 Cherenkov telescopes to, to, to unveil the gamma ray universe. And uh, associated to this process, we, we help to build one of the prototypes of the telescope prototypes of CTA, the ASTRI, prototype, and we are also uh, constructing with the Italians the Astra Mini Array that is going to be the precursor of the CTA uh, uh, that is already in construction with nine of such structures in Tenerife. And um, okay, uh, also I should mention that this inspiration provided by offers uh, legacy, offers uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge and uh, motivated me actually uh, was one of the motivations uh, for myself and Alex Lazarian and Pepe Franco, Alex Lazarian from the University of uh, Wisconsin and uh, Pepe Franco from the University Autonoma, Universidad Autonoma de Mexico uh, to create this international conference named Magneto Fields in the Universe from Laboratory and Start to the Primordial Universe. Uh, we started in 2004 
and we have had since then seven conferences, seven editions of this conference. And I should say that in the very first uh, conference proceedings book, I wrote a dedication to offer in this book. So it's there, all these, uh, you know, in, in these two, 2004 uh, four, uh, proceedings book of magnetic fields in the universe. So this is the kind of inspiration that, you know, it's, it's here heritage, offers heritage. Uh, offered due to his, uh, as a recognition of his um, uh, outstanding scientific career and uh, the formation of new generations of students, he, he was uh, awarded a meritorious uh, professor uh, title in 2015, and there was this ceremony. Um, uh, Laert Sodre was then the, the, the director of uh, IAG. So here you see he delivering to offer the diploma. And there was uh, this, uh, this celebration, this, this tribute, and they invited Vera Jatenko and myself to, to represent the students. So they invited us to stay on the table along with the offer, of course, Laerte, the director, and the head of the astronomy department, uh, Roberto Costa. And I, 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 I put this picture here to, to show that Mirav came to the celebration and she, she said wonderful words uh, about offers career, early career, etc. So to, you may see some pictures here, uh, Mirav, uh, Marcia, the, the, the secretary of the director, um, a wonderful person, a very good friend of offer as well. Here the audience, here some of his students again, uh, ex-students, right? And here you can see Rogério in this picture, Laerte, um, Jacques Lepin is here, Zulema here, and Jorge Matzas is, is here with offer. So it, it was a nice celebration as well. Just that, you know. Uh. Finally, last but not least, I should mention that uh, all, all, all. We're waiting, all guys, we are waiting. <laughs> uh, yeah, so all you, all you guys, you know quite well how humorous person uh, offer was and uh, he was always you know ready to uh, jump with us uh, together with us into funny uh, activities funny funny uh, you know funny enterprises and uh, sapi was one of these uh, funny enterprises actually what is sapi sapi is the acronym for uh, in portuguese for Parallel Astronomical Society. And so we had this group, you know, and uh, we have annual Brazilian astronomical meetings and the acronym for the Brazilian Astronomical Society is SAB, S-A-B. So SAP was the Parallel Astronomical Society. And what uh, did we do in this Parallel Astronomical Society? Well, we, we used to present performances, uh, parodying, the real astronomical society, the speakers and the talks of the real astronomical society. So every last night of the annual Brazilian astronomical society meetings, we would have a SAPI show, right? Uh, with these parody talks and songs and all this stuff. This was also, the, these activities, uh, funny activities were also, and we, we used to, to, to have them also in, in the advanced schools in astronomy and astrophysics that were organized every two years. And later on in the nine, in the, this was, uh, we started this in the early nineties when we were still students. And so this group started with students, postdocs and professors, professors with this uh, open mind, you know, like offer uh, Maciel, Zulema and others, right? But okay, we started all this and they joined us together and we continued as uh, later on as colleague, colleagues and, 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 and professors as well, we continued this mission on SAPI. 
And it turns out that here there are a few pictures of the activities of SAPI. So for instance, Offer is giving one, these, one of these parody uh, um, uh, talks, you know, uh, parodying some earlier official talk uh, in the official Brazilian meeting. It was really funny, really, really amazing. Actually, yeah. you remember the song he had when you're old and that he described a star in his last ages. He had a song about it that he used to sing. Yeah, that, that's true. We can, we, we can try to sing these things later, right? But there is a little surprise here, okay, before that. But, but yeah, we, we can try to, 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 reco to remember these songs and even try to sing here. That would be fun. On. Yeah, definitely. But here there, are, uh, there is a picture of one of these sub meetings. So you can see offer here, right? Uh, Vera is here as well, Vera, myself. We had even a dog as a supporting actor in this, in this sub meeting. So, and several teachers and the students, uh, Luis Carlos Japelis is here. Uh, 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 Horvath, George Horvath, the the SAP the SAPI director is is here. So um, so you see, uh, former offers students who who helped to found SAP uh, kept working on these activities. Actually, still nowadays, I mean, um, we, we do this. We we used to do this, but anyways, uh, and uh, it happened that in in the early times, uh, offer. Uh, um, uh, not only he 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 performed he he presented these uh, talks, but he also composed uh, songs. You know, adapting the words of uh, uh, famous songs to 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 plasma, to physics, to cosmology, and things like that, and really funny songs. And he would play the guitar, and uh, Vera Adriana Vera. Adriana and myself as his PhD students, we would sing along with him. So we were then now as uh, we were then called and are still now as the Oferetis. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, I'd like to finish this, you know, this testimony with uh, remembering one of his songs, this Let My Plasma Go. It's just a, a, a piece, the entire- This is wonderful, story. wonderful. Yeah. But, but anyways, I, I will, I will uh, try to, to sing it. <clears throat> oh, where are the first clouds formed? Let my plasma go. Did they end up in a fire? Let my plasma go. Oh, I have to tell you, these are the signs that Moses said. Oh, I have to tell you, let my plasma go, let my plasma go. Bye, my, my friend, my forever Bye. advisor, colleague, rest in peace in God. Of course, if you can stop even for a minute in heavens. Goodbye, my friend. Lindo, Lindo, Lindo. Okay, that, that's it, guys. Ah, obrigado, Beth. Alguém, alguém quer fazer um comentário? I only remember that other song, Betty, that when you're old and with, I think he was talking about yeah, white dwarfs, that yeah. will, you, will you take care of me? When I'm yeah. old, it's beautiful. I'm old. Yeah. When yeah. you're old, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but it describes the ejection of yeah. layers. When you're taking... old, and a lot of la 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 yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, See, that's the one about dark energy, isn't it? Using the yeah, word. The dark yeah, energy. yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. The chutzpah, Rogerio. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> Sing about, can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah.
So you know, guys, I I I I have to mention that I I had to to sing this song several times yesterday because the first time when I I sang, you know, it was hard. Then it became easier to 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 sing, and it it it, it is really I I chose this one because you know this is let my plasma go, let let him go. You know, it's it's fine. It, it it's great. I mean, he 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 will be always with us. He's with us. He's with us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I have to it, say that is so actually, wonderful. Yeah. Let 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 the plasma continue. <laughs> exactly. Know? Exactly. Exactly. I have to say that in meetings I meet Betty. Um, we we met several times in Kospar, that is all over the world. And it's just so fantastic to run into Betty. And we yeah. both know that we're working in the same field that my dad started. <laughs> exactly. Great. And uh, Merav, I should mention, you probably, you guys, you don't remember me, but I, I met you too when you were still kids in, in Kran. Because at that time I was I was doing scientific initiation. I was still an undergrad student. I was uh, in physics, and I I was doing scientific initiation with the Zulema. And Zulema took me to Atibaia, and then you uh, uh, you were there with Offer and Erella. The entire family were spending some time there, and I met you you guys you, running away from the were. fogs and snakes. <laughs> exactly from the fogs. That's true. That's true. Yeah, so. Ah, Betty, uh, first of all, I mean, so, so, so grateful uh, for, for your words. Incredibly meaningful. I wanted to tell you that uh, Owen, uh, he had a lot of sayings, you know, uh, the Bible on what to do, what not to do, very general. And he believed you need to work. This is way before we, uh, I worked on, on optics. Uh, you need to be a laser. I don't <laughs> know if you, if, you, if you ever heard him say that, but work like a laser. <laughs> and it always came with like Batchy. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Which means I didn't know that he would oh, yes. you say so even nowadays. <laughs> I mean even even in the, the late times. I mean he used to say that to me when you know when we started all this. And the, yeah, uh, uh, I, and I, also I work you, I, we, I, I work directly with the author only during the PhD, but you know his his uh, he was always in my spirit. I mean, as a as a guide, really, uh, you know, uh, as a spiritual guide. I, his ideas, his his advices were always with me, and I try, you know, to transmit this to my own yeah. students. Yeah. He also, he also, uh, you also mentioned that uh, he kept uh, saying. Uh, be courageous, do big work, be creative. Be, you know. yeah. <laughs> so uh, later in life, I guess he the, the, it, the ideas always remain the same, but the sentences varied a little bit. So uh, for my group at least, and for my, my work is always, so what's the big question? <laughs> yes. It's a big what, question. Yes, this is how he always uh, he started our meetings, group meetings with his students. What is the big question? <laughs> the question of the week. And then we had to, uh, uh. But it wasn't, yeah, the question, the huge question of the week. <laughs> yes, yes. Something like that. Yes, that's true indeed. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Okay. Um, so, so we can um, break. I, I leave this Zoom open, of course. People can still talk, um, but we have a, a lunch here in Brazil. Lunch and time. you guys yeah. in New York can have breakfast. Or sorry about being early for you. Uh, and then, and then we return at uh, 